condition to have your products created, made, manufactured, raw materials in China. Uh, governments now are demanding that companies withdraw from China. Japan is an example of that right now. Uh, repatriation of manufacturing back to China is a huge area. Uh, Samsung has already withdrawn from China. They're not making their mobile phones anymore. And this is going to continue. This is going to continue. The British government have already announced uh, benefit packages for companies to withdraw from China. And of course, with the, the dilemmas from President Trump four years, uh, it, it doesn't matter what President Biden's going to do. He's not going to repair what's happened over the past four years. So supply chain dynamics, international business is, is ultimately changing as we speak. Mm. There's, there's, there's a new normal, and the normal is localization. Uh, large retail food stores, Walmart, as the, these large areas of shopping facilities, uh, they're not going to be with us in the next five to seven years. Uh, people want more local food. They don't want to have to drive their car to a big shopping center. Uh, they want to go somewhere local and pick up fresh food daily or every two days. Uh, here in Thailand, there's a, a, a large debate why uh, the big C, which is a shopping center similar to Walmart or Tesco, uh, why the big C is opening small stores similar in size to 7-Eleven. And the, uh, the, the, the people's perception is that Big C is uh, crushing the small guy, right? But actually, Big C is following a global supply chain shift where people want to be more local, where they shop every day rather than shop once a week. They want fresher food. They want uh, less uh, preservatives in their food. The packaging has to be... Uh, map packaging, which is modified atmosphere packaging, where if you buy a salad and the package is puffed out, uh, we introduce a, a, a gas in there. Uh, so you and me, the consumer, we want this freshness. We want to go out and shop today, not once a week for our children, our family. And uh, this means these big, huge stores are reducing in size and becoming more local rather than being very, very large. Uh, so, yeah, you know, supply chain and international business is, uh, is driving that, right? is driving that factor. Maybe we can talk about a few of those today with, uh, with our students when they join us. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Indonesia has tremendous potential. You're also part of the G20, the only Asian country in the G20, Indonesia. Phenomenal when you think of the size of the financial backings of Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, they're not in the G20. Yeah, we also we have, have different mindset. Mindset. in the palms and most of the rubber. I think that's the main uh, consumption from this country. It can be one of them. It, you can definitely uh, develop a comparative advantage globally and be the number one global rubber producer, which we'll discuss today, merely because of the size of your territory. Your footprint is phenomenal and the weather is ideal for growing sustainable products such as rubber. Coming from a plastics world, uh, we've already always been governed by uh, if fuel prices are high, then plastic uh, becomes very, very cheap uh, because we use uh, uh, a flake. But if all of a sudden fuel price prices drop, then plastic becomes too expensive and people look for alternatives, which are petro petroleum-based based plastics, and they're more harmful to the environment. Right? Uh, Mr. Patrick, uh, we are now uh, having the Mr. Rector who would like to come in as soon as possible and he is now in waiting room and I think we have already accepted him. Perhaps we are going to start a few minutes more. Ah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Bapak Rektor.
Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi Good morning. Good morning, oh. Rector. Sir Patrick, how are you? I'm very well, sir. Good morning. And how are you, Dean? Alhamdulillah, I'm very good. Thank you so much for uh, being here for this uh, uh, webinar or uh, apa, uh, guest lecture. Yes, yes, guest lecture for this event. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm always excited to share and talk to students. I'm hopeful, having spent considerable time working with Mr. Mohammed, that the students will engage with the lecture today. I, I, I hope they have questions about such a dynamic industry of international business, which is uh, what we're going to talk about today. So I think we maybe start uh, right now, Mr. Patrick and Bapak Rektor. Okay, let's do so. Okay. So, okay. So ladies and gentlemen, to start this webinar, first of all, I would like to inform you that please turn the mute button while the, uh, the webinar is started. And also, I would like to start uh, from a few minutes from now. Okay. So we are starting now. Our Honorable Head of Afian Hussein Foundation, our Honorable Rector of Institute of Informatics and Business Dharma Jaya, our Honorable Guest Lecturer of University of the West of England, United Kingdom, Mr. Patrick Mycruden, our first, second, and third Vice Rector of Institute of Informatics and Business Dharma Jaya, our Deans and Heads of Department of Institute of Informatics and Business Dharma Jaya, and of course, our honorable guests, lecturers, and beloved students. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Thank you so much. Tabi pun. Iya pun. Iya pun. First of all, allow me to praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of His grace and blessing upon us so that we are able to attend the virtual guest lecture with the topic Challenge and Opportunities in Global Businesses presented by the lecturer from University of the West of England, UB Bristol, Mr. Patrick Mycruden. And also all of the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and also of course our beloved students. First of all, let's open this guest lecture today by singing together the national anthem of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya.
masih di mood lihat ada Mister Duyan your microphone is still mute oke okay, I'm sorry oke okay, uh, for the next section ladies and gentlemen and beloved students let's our gratitude deliver to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala our the only God by praying for the success of this guest lectures to Ustadz Suratno time is yours thank you Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma shalli wa sallim ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina Muhammad. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Hamdan syakirin hamdan amin. Hamda yuwafi na'amahu wa yukafi majida. Ya rabbana laka alhamdu kama yang bakir jalan yusul karim wa azim sultani. Allahumma gfir lana dunubana wa li walidayna wa rahmatuma kama rabbil ala syihara. Wali jamil muslimin wal muslimat wal mu'minin wal mu'minat al ahya minhum wal amwat ya qadiyal hajat inna kala kulsin qadir Rabbana dalamna anfusana wa ilam tawfirna wa tarhamna lanakuna min al-tawshiri Rabbana la tu'ahidna inna syina wa afa'na Rabbana wa la tahmil alina islam kama hamal tahu wa lalladina min kubrina Rabbana wa la tuhamilna ma'ala tawqatlana wa fa'ana wa fillana wa rahamna awa kama lana wa tawshirna ala kumil kafirin Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa turiyatina turata'ayin Ya Allah, in the name of God, the gracious upon you. I seek refuge in Allah from Shaitan the Ajaz. I ask to the only Allah, His scripture and His truth. Ya Allah, for this from holy hellfire, Ya Allah. Rabbana aral haqqa haqqa wa rizukna al-kiba'a. Wa aral batila batila wa rizukna al-shinama. Rabbana ya Allah, atina fi dunia hasana. Atil afrati hasana tawa kina ala banar, wa kina ala banar, wa kina ala banar. Halo. Oke, ladies and gentlemen. Ya. We are now on welcoming speech for this guest lecture with welcome remarks. Oh, oh, nanti sore aja kali ya jam uh, ya. Please turn the mic button. Tiga. Ya. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now on welcoming speech yeah. for this guest lecture with welcoming remarks by Mr. Rector of Institute of Informatics and Business Dharma Jaya to Mr. Firman Shah, Uni Alfi Alfian MBA MSc. Please, time is yours. Thank you, Mr. Buyan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Our Honorable Head of Alfian Hussein Foundation, Honorable Lecturer of University of the West of England, United Kingdom, Mr. Patrick McLuhan, PhD, our first, second, and third Vice Rector, Deans and Heads of Department of EB Dharma Jaya, and of course, our Honorable Guest Lecturers and my beloved students. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya pun. Good morning and best wishes for all of us. First of all, allow me to praise to Allah Subhanahu wa taala. Always give thousands of blessings to all of us so that we are all healthy, very well and can do our daily routines. On behalf of the Rector of Institute of Informatics and Business Dharma Jaya, or known as CB Dharma Jaya, I would like to express a sense of happiness and proud because our honorable guest lecturer of University of the West of England, Mr. Patrick McCruden, is able to willingly come and give guest lecture to our beloved campus through online platforms. <laughs> 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 experience related to international business, especially challenges and opportunities in global businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now living in amazing transformations. The transformations that are influencing all people, all sectors, and all movements. One of the current transformation that is felt by all of us right now is communication. The actual story of people who have already talked to the friends of new or new colleges that lives abroad through internet, email, and social media is one of the examples of virtual communication developments. Because of this situation, we are now aware that we must open our mind and walk 
borderlessly to reach international exposure through virtual yeah. platform in this era. One of our readiness to encounter this era is by implementing teaching and learning processes based on the recent development of information technology so that our graduates are ready to face the openness of recent information. This implementation is uh, reflected on the vision of our university. Our university vision is to become, to be the excellent teaching and research-based university that is recognized internationally. To reach the excellent teaching and research-based university that is recognized internationally, Ibi Dharma Jaya has involved academician, for example, staff, students, and lecturers to actively join academic international programs, such as international exchange of faculty and students, international visiting lecture, international joint final project supervision, international joint research, international internship, and international summer program. Ibi Dharma Jaya also encourages all staff, students, and lecturers to open and receive international exposure that is eventually applied in EB Dharma Jaya. For example, implementing the teaching and learning processes in international class, promoting international activities, receiving international students from outside Indonesia, and introducing local wisdoms to international students who are and will study in EB Dharma Jaya. EB Dharma Jaya conducts cooperation with universities throughout the world in the field of curriculum, teaching and learning methods, researches, exchanges of students and faculties, academic seminars, exchanges of academic publication, and other academic activities. Furthermore, Ibi Dharma Jaya has also recently collaborated and strengthened the cooperation with excellent universities in Indonesia and throughout the world. It is seen from 60 universities consisting of universities from Malaysia, Vietnam, India, Taiwan, China, United Kingdom, Russia, and Turkey. Ibi Dharma Jaya also has a plan to collaborate with top 100 QS universities as it is the great steps to achieve what we call Campus Merdeka, the national academic policy established by the Ministry of Education and Culture of Republic of Indonesia to upgrade the quality of tertiary education which is private and public universities in Indonesia by expanding the web of cooperation with universities throughout the world with the aim of being able to work together with world-class university by implementing academic activities all together in this globalization era. We realize that the national and international collaboration will bring influence to all of us. I do hope that this influence brings my beloved students to become the best. As the motto of our Ibi Dharma Jaya, the best standing for taqwa, heart, empathy, brilliant, energetic, synergy, and trustworthy. Therefore, our students are expected to become a special personality who possesses all those values. Ladies and gentlemen, last but not least, this is my entire welcoming speech. We all really do expect that this guest lecture presented by Mr. Patrick McCrudden, McCrudden PhD brings the positive results for our betterment, especially for world recognition. Therefore, Ibi Dharma Jaya is really able to uh, work together, improve together, and achieve together in the world-class academic adventure in this globalization era. May the divine blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect and guide all of us. Thank you so much for your attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Mr. Rector. And we are going to the next sessions. We are going to the next sessions. Please turn on the camera and we would like to start the photo sessions. Yeah. To Mr. Ketut, please, you be ready to screen shot our yes, already our picture. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yeah, start one, two, three. Okay. Uh, the next slide. Yeah. Uh, okay. 
one, two, three. Yeah. The next, yeah. one more. One, two, three. Okay, finish. Thank you so much. And then to the main sessions of the SA agenda, the guest lecture presented by Mr. Patrick Maikruden, moderated by Ms. Cahyani Pratisti. Therefore, all of the agenda is fully replaced to Mr. Moderator, Ms. Moderator. Okay, to Ms. Moderator, time is yours, Ms. Cahyani. Thank you, Mr. Duyan, Muhammad Duyan. All of participants, uh, before we start the guest lecture, I will read out the agenda. The first is guidance of guest lecture. This session is introduction to our guest lecture, Mr. Patrick. The third is guest lecture. The fourth Q and A session, and the fifth is conclusion. All of participants, ladies and gentlemen, the guidance of our guest lecture is: the first, the participant join the Zoom meeting minimum fifteen minutes before we start the guest lecture. The second, during the guest lecture, the participant are expected to open camera and unmute model. The third, the participant can give a question after the lecturer finish his lecture to chat box or raise hand with mention her or his name first. The fourth, the participant are not allowed to leave the guest lecture before the guest lecture finish. All of participants, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to start this Lecture, Mr. Patrick McCruden, PhD. Patrick, Patrick McCruden, with over three decades of business experience and a wealth of real-life marketable expertise, possessing a hands-on participant leadership style and transferable skill set, knowledgeable innovator with proven critical thinking and project management capabilities can lead multidisciplinary teams, ensuring that the vision and mission materialize. A clear under understanding or of communication, negotiation, motivation, and strategic business development combined with excellent knowledge and understanding of the United Kingdom or H. A universities making systems reinforced with enduring process and controls, grading, teaching, and further learning, there be delivering academic excellence where he has the privilege to work and share his knowledge. Over the last 25 years, Pratik's career has taken him to multiple countries concentrating on supply chain activities for design and manufacturing of stainless steel in China, precision industrial grade and food grade plastics manufactured in several industrial nations and, and distribution in the Philippines to mention just a few. Patrick's educational background complement his many years in industry concentrating on procurement, logistic, and supply chain, of which he gained an, a distinction from the University of Salford, UK. Currently, Patrick is completing his final PhD year researching global rice value chains in Myanmar. When Patrick has free time, away from grading MBA placement and MBA dissertation submission, he enjoys reading, gardening, music, and art with the occasional tiger beer. Around 65 minutes, Mr. Patrick will give the guest lecture. So, Mr. Patrick, time is yours. Thank you so much. Miss Pratisi for a warm welcome and introduction. Uh, I must say that I've actually gained a few extra minutes as well, which is very, very good. 
A warm welcome to all the students today here at the university. I'm very pleased to have the chance to come and speak with all of you today. Uh, here at the University of West England in Bristol, as you can see, we have a teaching gold excellence framework. We are ranked as top 30 universities in the UK, and we are ranked as the 21st university in the Guardian grades or uh, scales of university, which we attain each year, and ranked as the second university in the UK for the students satisfaction survey. A little bit of information about me. Uh, um, my background is 30 years experience within global manufacturing and supply chains. I've worked for many multinationals uh, in just a few of the countries that I've mentioned there. Um, my highest academic post was Dean of Academic Quality for MIBA University in Myanmar. Some of you might know that there is some difficulties in Myanmar at the moment and many of the foreign lecturers, uh, their visas were canceled and we had to leave the country. My educational background, uh, I'm in my, my final months of my PhD, which is concentrating on rice value supply chains in Myanmar. Myanmar is noted as being one of the largest rice exporters uh, in the world for many, many years. And due to climate change, uh, rice isn't being grown as much. And I'm researching how we can introduce value to that. I have a double master's distinction in procurement logistics supply chain. And I'm a member of uh, several bodies that deal with either logistics, uh, hazard analysis, or supply chain infrastructure development. International business, we're gonna talk about that today. And we're gonna look at what we think it is and what it should be. Uh, right now, I'm going to give you all two minutes to write down on a piece of paper, or if you wish, you can type your answers in the chat box. Uh, write down what is your understanding of international business? What does it mean to you? And secondly, uh, please tell me uh, how can this type or style of business benefit Indonesia? So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. Uh, starting now, please write down in the chat box, uh, or if you feel shy, you don't want to put in the chat box, then at least write down uh, where you are on a piece of paper or on your computer. Um, what is your understanding of international business? And how can this type or style of business benefit Indonesia? So your understanding might be, what does international mean to you? Is it importing, exporting, is it making something? Is it looking at a new idea which another country might want to purchase? Is it looking at what you might be growing, developing or extracting from within Indonesia, and maybe sending it abroad. What is your understanding of international business? What does it mean to you? And secondly, how do you think your answer is going to benefit Indonesia? You are the new business entrepreneurs of your great country, your great nation. So how will your first answer, how will it benefit Indonesia from a business perspective? Could it help 
from a business perspective, social concerns in your country? Could you generate new ideas for new businesses from an entrepreneurial perspective? Could you introduce manufacturing? Or manufacturing would mean you could be creating new jobs for a new product or service that you've identified. Okay, uh, for all the participants, please uh, write down your, uh, what do you know about uh, international business and uh, what is international business is benefit or ben not good or not good for Indonesian uh, business. You can uh, write in chat box. Yeah. So we've got some answers here. Yes, we've got some answers here for the trading of goods and services. Yes, knowledge is a very good one, especially in today's world with internet transactions. Okay, uh, on purchasing, selling of goods, commodities and services outside the nation's border. That's very true. <laughs> service between two or more countries. Very good. Yes, corporations are involved, multinational, transnational also. But you could also be a local company who's interested in exporting a product without making any changes to it. So these are very good answers. And I'm sure you have a lot more. One student here, international business is great activity to, oh, it's moved. Great activity in earning higher profits, possible, possible. Another student where activities of cross-border, that's very true also. You have trading blocks like ASEAN, where they are uniquely beneficial to all those within the group. The trading of goods, technology, capital and knowledge across national borders. Very good, very good. So I'm going to continue now with the... Uh, the presentation so we can move on. So thank you for engaging with some of your wonderful answers. And here I'm going to give you uh, how we understand international business, right? So it's the increasing of sales of your product or service. So we're looking for new markets, not only within our domicile country, but new markets outside of the country. And international business spends a vast amount of time, money, effort, and energy, understanding where the new market is. Is it possible that the new market would actually like our product and service, want to purchase our product and service, right? We acquire new resources and knowledge, but you're dealing with a different market. Organizational behavior is one aspect of, of dealing with a new understanding within a marketplace. Why would people in this other country purchase your product, right? And ultimately, we want, from an international perspective, we're looking for, as I said, new markets. So we want to reduce the risk associated by only being in one local market. Uh, the only way to expand and increase your business is by engaging in a globalization strategy, getting into new markets in other countries. So international business, we're gonna talk about some of the factors involved with international business. Each one of these statements can consist of individual con 
companies working within one country or more. So it consists of multiple activities, uh, international investment, foreign direct investment. This is where an organization can uh, introduce the idea of foreign money. It could also include uh, not only cash, it can also include technology. It could be equipment, which is purchased from one country as part of the investment strategy to be used in another country. Uh, international business identifies on global levels where countries are investing internally in products or services that can definitely be used in other countries in terms of purchase power. Often we find manufacturing is concentrated in certain countries. Example, China for many, many years has been identified as a global manufacturing hub. China has often uh, maintained the position that the technical capabilities of its employees are far better than in other countries. And they've often outlined the fact that it's more cost effective if you're in China. So taxation, importation, exports of semi-finished or finished products. Uh, this is how international business identifies which countries are better than others. And that leads on to the internal functions of the organization from a strategic business management scenario. Where is our market growth potential? Where should we design, build, manufacture, and export our products or services from? Production and manufacturing systems, uh, globally, from an international perspective, everyone wants to ensure that the product or service meets a particular quality. We introduce ISOs or international standards. Most commonly in manufacturing is the ISO 9000 and ISO 9001. This guarantees the product has been designed and manufactured to a certain quality standard. And you and I, the purchaser, we come accustomed to these processes. Process within supply chains. If we're talking about food, which is grown in one country and shipped to another country, we're looking for health and safety. Uh, food might need to be warehoused in a dry environment or refrigerated or frozen. So processes within supply chains is definitely an interest for international business managers. Operation management throughout the supply chain from the raw material inputs, which is up at the top of the supply chain, right through to the inputs, which have been converted into a new product or service uh, at the bottom of the supply chain. And then what we're ultimately looking for is creating a value within the supply chain. At each point, we eliminate waste. Time can be considered as waste. When we identify value, we're looking precisely at value adding. Value adding does not mean adding a process to each stage. Value adding could also mean removing a process from the stage, making that process faster. So these elements and factors are constantly discussed, constantly identified, and constantly reviewed on a monthly or quarterly basis when we talk about international business. We're going to look at some comparisons here between a local business or a domestic business and an international business. What are the differences? Ultimately, business transactions right, for international business are done through countries. Right? So it's a crossing of boundaries or borders. Definitely, when you cross a boundary or border, you'll be dealing probably in another currency. So currency fluctuations could be a factor that the organization looks at. It might not be beneficial to be moving your product or service to another country because of currency problems. Often, currencies are 
pegged to the dollar. So in some countries, if the dollar is stronger than the other, it might be a negative factor from an international business concern. Cultures, probably, in my opinion, one of the most important factors of international business. How do you deal with people from another country? Different cultures, different holidays during the year. We talk about religious uh, events which are happening. Uh, shipping, although it happens 24-7 worldwide, uh, people in international business are very aware of when shipments must arrive. Uh, for example, uh, in Europe, which is a Christian country, we know that uh, Saturday, Sunday, people are not working because Sunday is a day of rest. In other countries, it's Friday. So when you're looking at cultures, you must be equally aware that one country's understanding of business may be slightly different in another countries. So international business crosses such borders to make all parties equally happy with what is transacting. The legal system is another subculture in other words. Different countries have different legal systems, legal requirements. International business takes a viewpoint to understand whatever product or service is being made, transported, and arrives in another country, we ensure that the legal systems are followed to the letter. The availability of resources. Now, this is a very good example of how different resources are taken from different countries and shipped to other countries where processing from a manufacturing perspective is done. Often resources which, for example, are taken from the ground. Uh, one large resource area uh, in Africa is the mining of minerals, which are then shipped to different countries for processing when making electronic goods. Uh, China is a large importer of these raw elements because China has built up a very strong processing sector of various elements ranging from raw ores, coppers, to much finer elements when making such products like mobile phone screens, for example. And finally, is the skill set which are required in different countries and the knowledge capabilities. Uh, if we look at ASEAN, we find that many people, many students, when they graduate, if they want to be working from a, a creative perspective or involved in a creative entrepreneurial mindset, they tend to migrate to Singapore. In Singapore, you'll find a strong skill sector from the financial world, but also the investment sector for new ideas. So again, uh, we identify different skills and knowledge areas. Another one would be California, uh, Cupertino, which is where you find the big uh, technology companies. And also in Europe, uh, there are Germany for manufacturing. And in the UK, uh, in different parts of the UK, we, we have a, a strong specialty in medicine. So these are where, from an international perspective, students and businesses look for skills and knowledge zones. So again, looking a little further and deeper in the differences between domestic and international business, business transaction in a single country versus cross-national boundaries, where you'd be looking at different currencies. Uh, international business would have a constant eye, uh, often per day, on the currency fluctuations, both local and the international currency. Uh, different legal systems and practices. Uh, it's very clear there are different laws and requirements in Indonesia than they are in Thailand, where I'm located today. And culture, as I mentioned earlier, is one area that I always 
spend a lot of time working on from international business is how to work with different people from different cultures. Uh, so I have a statement that I've been using for 30 years. When I meet new people from a different company in a different culture, I generally will open up a statement uh, like this. How can I help you help me? Uh, and often I find uh, that I opened up the chance where both me and this new person can find a commonality of how we're going to work together, even though we're from different cultures. So you might want to use that. Uh, how can I help you help me? It's a sharing of understandings that both of you can bring so much to the table. Uh, different availability of resources, not only in terms of what is under the ground, but also we talk about skill sets and knowledge. So business activity, what are the drivers when we talk about international business? Exporting and importing of products, either semi-finished or finished. Uh, countries are, especially governments, are always interested in exporting their raw materials to other countries, uh, local and far, in the hope of gaining some financial incentives. Uh, international investments, where we have foreign direct investments, not only for companies in terms of cash or actual equipments, but also international investments of buying shares in other companies in other countries. International licensing, again, this could point directly to manufacturing, where a product is licensed in one country, but the international manufacturing license is provided to those manufacturers in another country. An example I would give you here is in different countries, they manufacture plastic, but the licenses are hauled under patent controls by other companies in different countries. The example I will give you when I worked in the UK for a very large plastics manufacturer, we would license other manufacturers in different countries, such as Spain, East and West Coast in America, and also China, uh, where they would manufacture the plastic to our specification so we could service our customers in those countries. It saved on time, money, effort, and energy, and also in supply chain routing to allow other companies to manufacture our products. International franchising, well, I hope I don't make everyone hungry, but this could be Pizza Hut, McDonald's, KFC, uh, just sticking with the food areas where the franchise, master franchise, is provided to one company in a host country, uh, but the actual franchise and patents and processes uh, are actually owned by a main country, which is headquartered somewhere else, maybe in America or in Europe, and international management contracts, which has grown over the past 20 years, which takes us into manufacturing, uh, which also takes us into uh, process controls. It could be where uh, Price, Coopers or Waterhouse uh, comes and does audits in different companies for different countries, executives, etc. So this is a, potentially could be a service driven economy where uh, different well-respected companies would come to your company in your country and offer specific management contracts. And this also goes for construction, design, development, and operation. So if you have some beautiful buildings, which I know you have uh, in Indonesia, you might employ a foreign project management company to operate your building to a certain international standard. Uh, International investments, as I mentioned there, uh, foreign direct investments is companies located in one country and where they uh, are working with government who permits often uh, foreign investment. Uh, quite often you find some governments uh, have certain policies where they limit the investment and other uh, times they will change the policy to introduce greater investment. When we look at foreign portfolio investment, 
This is where we have uh, organizations, potentially hedge funds in one country who are investing substantially in another company located somewhere else by purchasing their stock, right? Now, I'll give you a case in point here, an example for foreign direct investment. Uh, the number one rice producer uh, in the world today is Vietnam. Uh, last year, it was Thailand. These two countries have held the number one, number two position for many, many years. But we understand that this year, the number one position is actually going to be Cambodia. Now, where did Cambodia suddenly come from? Because 10 years ago, Cambodia was number nine on the global rice production chain. Well, 10 years ago, the Cambodian government, they changed their foreign direct investment policy where they permitted. Now, they had a caveat where the FDI could only come from those people living, working, or host countries within ASEAN, but they permitted foreign direct investment into the rice mills in Cambodia. And over the last 10 years, rice milling has been number the one, number one in terms of growth uh, within Cambodia. And because the most advanced rice mills have been built, including parboiling, packaging, and uh, deliveries worldwide, uh, we expect Cambodia will be the number one rice producer and exporter for 2022, pushing uh, Vietnam into the number two spot and Thailand into the number three spot. So that's just an, an example of how foreign direct investment can uh, develop a nation. But quite often, you'll find that a government will introduce controls to ensure that foreign ownership uh, doesn't destroy local companies who may also want to be involved in that particular sector. Right. So international business activities and strategies. So let's look at the drivers. So we talk about strategies which are directly linked to the company's objectives. What is the company wanting to do? Uh, the company is looking for new markets. The company wants to uh, tell everyone all over the world, uh, please buy our product because it's perfect for you. But it, it's not as easy as that, right? So managers need to be explicit. They need to ensure that the company's uh, knowledge and infrastructure is able to meet the requirements and expectations of the uh, purchase, the buyer, the consumer in another country. We need to identify what is the competition uh, position in like in the other country? Are we going to come in uh, where our product is much cheaper than the competition or are we going to come in where our product is more expensive than the competition? Uh, so positioning uh, is something that international business identifies very clearly. And also when we identify where and which country we are going to uh, engage in, we also need to identify and uh, from a strategic position, explain and train to our employees why we are expanding into this new country, what the benefits is to our company in this new country, and what changes we may have to do during the processing. Now, what changes can be? For example, if you're manufacturing a, uh, a plastic bottle in Indonesia and you are uh, – wanting to export these plastic bottles. Well, it's very likely that the exporting of the bottle might require a different label. The label may be in a different language. Uh, the label may uh, explain uh, how to use the product. Uh, the product is safe. The, there'll be uh, hopefully the same ISO codes on the same label, but this information needs to be uh, delivered downstream into the organization so everybody realizes why the changes need to be done. So looking at Indonesia's exports, right, the top five there, oil and gas, various minerals, crude palm oil, uh, electrical appliances, uh, as semi-finished and finished products, and I've highlighted number five there as rubber production. And we're going to be talking about that 
uh, later this morning. Indonesia's exports for 2019 by country. You'll notice there the top three, China, USA, and Japan, uh, picking up a substantial amount of exports. This is telling you already this whole list from an international business perspective. This is the countries that the Indonesian government have trade agreements with, and they're substantially exporting substantial amounts of products, potentially raw material, semi-finished products, to these countries. Now, let's have a look at what imports Indonesia concentrates on. And you'll find here that there's a change. We have China at the top, Singapore, and Japan. US is number five here. And if we just go back to the first slide and look at China, so going back to the first slide, uh, Indonesia exports roughly $27 billion worth of products, but yet Indonesia imports $44 billion of products from China. And again, uh, you'll find that governments will discuss a trade balance or trade imbalance. Why is Indonesia uh, importing more from China? Uh, and we'll look at those uh, ideas today to understand why that might be a reason. But looking back at these two slides, slide one tells you the exports by country for 2019, China being 27 billion, USA uh, almost 18 billion, Japan 16 billion, but for imports, uh, China 44 billion. So definitely Indonesians are consuming more Chinese made products and services. Singapore, 17 point, uh, let's say close to 18 billion, and Japan, close to 16 billion. These two charts show you uh, how international business is conducted uh, just during 2019. And I'm sure those prices and numbers would have increased for 2020. It's possible there would be uh, drops in those numbers during the COVID period, but the data is yet to be published. Let's look at the business strategies that international business identifies. Now, uh, starting from low, bottom left, uh, an export strategy. This is a local business which deals in, uh, has the intention, if possible, to export product or service, but really doesn't want to make any changes to it. The multi-domestic strategy is where uh, there is potentially uh, exporting uh, looked at. Uh, some changes to the product or service is welcomed and may be changed if needed. Uh, standardization strategy, this is uh, often used by multinationals who want to manufacture, usually manufacturing, or produce something which is manufactured, such as milk powder, etc. Uh, but they want to control costs. They want to standardize everything. Everything is measured. Uh, usually in supply chains, when we look at a standardization strategy, we're talking about value creation throughout the supply chain. And our transnational strategy or a hybrid strategy which is really a combination of uh, two strategies, standardization and multi-domestic. So let's have a look at breaking these down further. Export strategy, this is a local domestic operation. Uh, it is very interested in exporting the product or service, most definitely. Uh, it wants to take advantages uh, if there is the chance, the possibility of exporting the product. Uh, but what it's not going to do, uh, the local company, they're not, they're not going to make any changes to it. And we use the term there, customization. They're simply going to say, here is the product. It's finished. It's packaged. It's labeled. And if you want to purchase it, uh, let me know how you want me to deliver it to you. Right. So there's no unique market positioning. It's uh, something that might be found online where someone in another country might want to purchase it and the information is given to the domestic operation and the product is delivered through 
any means. It could be shipped, it could be sent on a plane, uh, or it could be just uh, packaged and delivered uh, through a local postal service, right? So no global strategy is uh, created uh, in an export strategy. It's a local-based concept. However, a multi-domestic strategy makes a subtle change. It is interested and quite often promotes the fact that it will customize the product or service within the operation. Uh, you may want to change the color. You may want to change uh, the volume size of the packaging. You may be buying uh, a food product. Uh, they may be adding additional spices, for example, to the food product. So all sorts of customization. You might be buying uh, furniture where they're giving you a choice to change the, the wood veneer finishing. So this is a multi-domestic strategy. Uh, customers and employees at uh, different countries. So you may have uh, a, an office in Singapore, which is uh, taking orders for the product or service. Uh, those orders are collected and given to the, uh, the main local company, uh, which is able to respond to the customer needs and wants. Uh, but ultimately, it's a focus subsidiary, right? It's a focus subsidiary. It's groups of companies who are coming together uh, to change their products and services uh, in a customization fashion, right? They're all independent organizations uh, coming together to potentially produce one uh, product or a multitude of products, uh, and they can act on their own should they wish as being just a local domicile organization as well. Uh, product design, uh, distributed marketing and tastes, each one can work independently or they can work collectively to make those uh, customized products and services for a certain uh, order. Uh, two examples I'm going to give you here, Matahari department stores, uh, they work following a multi-domestic strategy and also Indomaret, they also follow a multi-domestic strategy. And, and as you are all aware, these are two large uh, corporations uh, which are in Indonesia. Uh, a mega national strategy or a standard strategy uh, often incorporated by large manufacturing or food production organizations. The ultimate direction here is cost reductions through economies of scale. Uh, when I advised Walmart when they were in China, uh, I tried to explain the economies of scale in China and the response they gave me was, uh, in America, Patrick, uh, our motto is stack it high, sell it low. Uh, and that's the cost reduction mantra. They want to produce as many of single units as possible to reduce the ultimate cost to produce that uh, unit of product that they need. So car manufacturing, uh, car prices worldwide uh, follow a price point. And for car manufacturers to make a profit, uh, they look throughout uh, their global manufacturing uh, supply chains to see where they can reduce uh, in every stage of their operation through value adding uh, theory to reduce costs, wastes, time. And uh, that's not through economies of scale. When we look at the efficiency of global integration, uh, as it was mentioned earlier by the dean of the university, uh, he mentioned global communication. So we look at efficiency uh, integ integrations through uh, speed of delivery, how uh, decisions are made, uh, what scale is created through a decision making process. Uh, often we look at headquarters, uh, look at creating the decision process of what will be manufactured in which country and why. A mega national strategy also takes into account 
local tax regulations in countries that are producing these particular products. So I'll give you an example. Uh, when I worked for Frankie as the supply chain director, um, in the year 2000, our global uh, shipping value was estimated to be $40 billion, uh, which is a substantial amount of money even today. Uh, one thing that we were very clear about in China is uh, China was very proactive in providing us with the smallest amount of tax as we would import our ready-made stainless steel. We would form the steel into uh, different under-counter refrigerations or uh, products that you would see in KFC or McDonald's or Starbucks. Uh, and then we would export a semi-finished product uh, with less than 1% of tax. Now, the moment the Chinese government in 2002 informed us that they were going to increase the tax by 1%, uh, Frankie decided to reroute its production manufacturing of some of its stainless steel to the Philippines. So the mega national strategy, we are always looking not at the cheapest country uh, for manufacturing. We also look at the what knowledge base is in that, what skills uh, does the workers provide in that country. But we're also looking at the taxation for import and export of semi-finished products. So key global distribution channels are important to us. Uh, they're normally closed channels uh, and uh, a global distribution channel, we're always checking the taxation as we move the product from one country to another. We don't want to be charged continuous taxes before the product is actually a finished product. So companies exploit location of economies for the past 20 years. China has been identified uh, as a, a, a country that we wanted to build and manufacturing. Vietnam has taken up a, a lot of the mantle for that now. They developed the uh, developments of manufacturing. Uh, this could be uh, an area that uh, Indonesia might want to consider exploiting, uh, but it takes a lot of investment. Uh, but what is uh, shown already in Indonesia is Daihatsu Motos are already uh, developing uh, products in, in the car industry uh, using a mega national strategy. And uh, again, sticking with the food element, uh, Pizza Hut uh, worldwide uses a mega national strategy. Why or how is it possible? Well, pizzas are pretty much the same all over the world, right? It's flat piece of dough baked in an oven. The only thing that would be slightly different would be the toppings that you would find uh, which will be locally produced toppings. Uh, but a Pizza Hut building follows the same standard architectural finish, the process of manufacturing the pizza dough, the storing of the food items in refrigerators, the refrigeration systems themselves, how the uh, staff are trained, their uniforms, uh, the seating arrangements, that all is standard globally for Pizza Hut. And the same would work for Daigo Tsumotsos or Samsung or any organization which is uh, deploying a mega national strategy. And the transnational strategy, uh, it's a hybrid of the two. So we talk about integrating global standards, uh, a multi-domestic, and we look at simultaneously uh, taking global and local and uh, trying to find new markets that would adopt to both of these. Uh, but the transnational strategy uh, always, in, always involves trade-offs. And the trade-offs are normally uh, the local trade-off. What can be done international might not be recognized uh, locally as being something that should be done or can be done. So when we look at a transnational strategy, it's a well-developed strategy, and it's where trade-offs are presented. And when we talk about trade-offs, trade-offs are usually presented by middle managers where they explain 
what is good but what cannot be done. Uh, it is possible to uh, reduce the, the different types of trade-offs. Obviously, you want to ensure that the trade-off does not uh, dilute the quality of the product or affect the, the, uh, the way the product has been designed. Uh, so you want to uh, retain that part of the product. But other trade-offs might be uh, announced. A trade-off that I can give you where is Actimel, which is a global yogurt producer. Uh, their uh, transnational strategy is to produce yogurt using locally produced milk in different countries. So when uh, Actimel... Uh, when Actimel... Uh, decided to uh, introduce yogurt into Russia, they knew straight away that uh, it would be very difficult for them mm -hmm. to bring milk into Russia to make the yogurt. So they had to work uh, and eventually they purchased a, a very large milk farm production company in Russia. Uh, the trade-offs there were more legal, what uh, as well as uh, in terms of how milk is transported. Russia is a very, very large uh, continent all on its own. Uh, and the trade-off was simple. Uh, you cannot uh, have a, a yogurt which is of a high quality from milk which is produced in other countries in Europe. Uh, you must identify a local milk producer, which is what Actimel actually did. Although Actimel is headquartered uh, in the US, they do have a smaller headquarter unit in Germany, uh, but predominantly it's a bottom-up uh, foreign subsidiary headquartered, uh, usually somewhere else where they're taking direct uh, guidance from. So, for example, Japanese manufacturers, there are many manufacturing plants throughout uh, the world, uh, but Toyota's global design, how things should be done, which elements in the cars must be used, uh, they're all decided upon uh, at the main headquarters. However, the trade-off is uh, local management and marketing activities can identify uh, what colors are good for a certain country, uh, what interiors are good for certain countries. For example, uh, uh, air conditioning units in hot countries uh, such as Indonesia or anywhere in ASEAN uh, does not require the air conditioning unit to also be a heater, for example. So that might make the car uh, a little bit cheaper uh, or less expensive to purchase than in a Western country, uh, which suffers a lot of cold or wet or windy nights where they would require, the driver would require a heater as well as an air conditioner. So uh, a transnational strategy also uh, involves trade-offs. Now, today, what we're going to talk about, uh, uh, you and I, uh, and please use the chat box, we're going to look at the future for Indonesian rubber, right? And what are your ideas? Now, at the end, I, I'll, I'll give you some ideas of my own. But before the end, I want you to discuss with me uh, by sharing your ideas in the chat box, uh, where you think, how you think, uh, what ideas you have uh, for the development of rubber in Indonesia. So let me give you some background on rubber, which I've been researching here. So 2019, Indonesian rubber exports were valued at 4 billion US dollars. If you go back to the export chart earlier, China is a large exporter. USA and Japan. Uh, so Indonesia is exporting to many of those countries. Uh, 2019, $4 billion. But actually, um, according to the Indonesian uh, second ranked leading natural rubber exporter, uh, and that's from uh, Statista 2021. Um, but in 2017, Indonesia exports was actually 5.1 billion. So there's been a, uh, an approximate 20% drop over a two-year period. And, uh, and I wondered why that would be. Uh, on further investigation, 
when we look at rubber production just in ASEAN, we're looking at per hectare, right, uh, roughly a thousand, just over a thousand kg in Indonesia per hectare. Malaysia is 1.5 uh, kilos per hectare. Vietnam a bit, a bit more, 1.72. Uh, but Thailand is getting close to being almost double, right? 1.8. Why is that? How come Thailand is producing almost double than Indonesia? It's a question that we might be able to answer today. Current issues for Indonesia is a low level of productivity per hectare. So if you have a lot of uh, independent growers, who don't necessarily have uh, training or access to investment or access to equipment. Uh, this can uh, cause havoc uh, and identified as low level productivity per hectare. Uh, old age of the trees, uh, rubber trees often take uh, six to eight years to grow and then they have a, a shelf life of roughly 25 years. Uh, so there may be an introduction there to look at uh, what trees are currently being uh, planted, uh, what is the uh, hectare of trees that have been planted, uh, bearing in mind there's this seven-year wait that the trees have to grow, and low investment capabilities for small farmers. Do they get any uh, financial assistance from government? And ultimately, uh, Reductions in rubber yields. Uh, are young people getting involved with the growth of trees, rubber trees particularly? Or are the younger generation uh, deciding that they want to work in other uh, types of sectors? So rubber reduction and yields is also uh, conducive to those who want to work uh, in those areas. Uh, downstream rubber industries, we're talking about depends on imports of processed rubber. Again, when we looked at the earlier chart, it showed that uh, 44 billion is uh, imported from China alone. Uh, is, it, is it a good idea for Indonesia to be uh, growing rubber and exporting the raw rubber? Or should Indonesia consider processing the rubber when we talk about value creation, right? And if so, what type of processing facilities uh, do we need, right? Uh, here we've identified uh, that there's a lack of processing facilities uh, for well-developed manufacturing. So the question is, why is that? And when we talk about domestic consumption, as it explains there, uh, Indonesia is predominantly producing raw rubber and 85% of it is in So, uh, we're going to look at uh, why that is and talk about it today. Uh, what do you actually produce in, Indone in Indonesia with rubber? Uh, Thai manufacturing industry, that's a local production. Rubber gloves, medical gloves, PPE, personal protective equipment, which involves uh, areas or elements of the gowns, which may be rubberized. Uh, rubber thread, often used in footwear or rubber for footwear and retread tires, uh, carpets, and other tools. And lastly, uh, over the last 10 years, uh, this is the global price of rubber. I looked at this yesterday. You'll notice uh, that this was taken, uh, just looking for the date there, uh, but the screenshot was from yesterday. You'll notice that there's been a steady decline from the highs of 2011 of $280 uh, per ton. It's now gone down to, I'd say, looking at that, it's dropped to maybe about $100, $102, $103 per ton at today's rubber prices. That's a global price. So um, I'm going to now uh, stop sharing as I uh, go back to the screen. Yeah. And I hope everyone is able to see me. I hope I didn't talk too long. Uh, I'm very much aware of the uh, the time that we have. Uh, 
uh, I think I'm three minutes over. My apologies for that. Uh, so students, what I'm uh, hoping uh, we're going to see today is uh, you're going to give me some ideas. Uh, and it could be good ideas. Don't worry about the idea being a crazy idea. Uh, you're going to give me some ideas and I'll try and talk about as many of them as I can uh, from the chat box of how are you going to continue uh, to develop the idea of rubber plantations? Bearing in mind that this is a, a product which is being grown uh, in Indonesia and is well uh, understood uh, and respected as being a, a very, very good product. But what is the future of rubber plantations and rubber itself in Indonesia? So uh, this is international business. Uh, type what you think your idea would be on how to develop uh, the product. Uh, why would you develop the product? What would you use to develop the product? Uh, which country do you think would be uh, a target for rubber? And maybe you could tell me why you think that is. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Patrick. Hello, Patrick. Hello. Okay. Uh, before, uh, while waiting uh, our student to answer the question, we can see it on chat box. There are two questions for uh, participant. The first is from Anton. Uh, we already answered the questions. Uh, how we um, differentiate uh, domestic and international business. Uh, we already uh, answered it. And the second question from Ibu Faurani. Ibu Faurani, for your information, is our Dean, Economic Faculty. Thank you for the uh, question, Dean. Yeah, she has a, a question. When we discuss about uh, flow of goods, services, human capital, innovation, data, information, knowledge, culture among countries or boundaries or territories. Mm. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, territories, sometimes we must afford to property right. For industry, of course, this is... Um, uh, wait a minute. Uh, for industry, this is a benefit because of it can protect the industry from variety of fraud, but not for science development. With this condition, why intellectual property right a major issue in international business today? Yeah, this. Uh, Dean, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a great question, and it really revolves around where is the control, ownership, and ultimate tax paid? And I give the example where organisations who want to ensure that their uh, intellectual property is controlled and the ownership is confirmed, meaning should, should anyone try to infringe on that intellectual property, the highest law of the land is there to support the owner of the intellectual property. So that means the jurisdiction has to be very strong uh, and the jurisdiction has to be able to deploy a mechanism that will relinquish uh, zero controls and maximum legal affect on the perpetrators who are engaging in a fraudulent misuse of the patent, right? Or ownership of the intellectual property. So I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard of the British company Dyson. They manufacture uh, vacuum cleaners, uh, hair dryers, and uh, air filters that you would use in your home, and also uh, machines for drying your hands. Um, they manufacture a specific motor in uh, two locations, one in the UK and also one in Singapore. Now, 
The first question you may ask is, why are they manufacturing such an expensive piece of equipment in Singapore? Why don't they go to Malaysia or Indonesia or another uh, country or China where the costs of manufacturing are vastly reduced, right? That would be the first question that anyone would ask. Uh, you know, Mr. Dyson, if you make that motor in a much more competitive country, maybe the cost of your product could be reduced, right? It's a fair question for someone to ask. The problem is the many patents involved in that motor. Anyone who tries to copy that motor, uh, maybe they can copy it. Maybe there is a lot of smart technical people in another country who can say, we know how to make a copy of the Dyson's new motor. Although he's invested uh, $20 billion in the design, the motor, the infrastructure, they manufactured new machines that could make this motor. If there's a group of people in uh, one country uh, that says they can copy it, okay, how can Mr. Dyson protect his patents? How can he do it? Well, let me tell you how he can do it. He goes to the Supreme Court or the Court of Justice in the UK and explains that his patents have been infringes, his technology has been stolen and is being recreated in another country. That's point one. That's the accusation, right? Two, he produces evidence of this. All he has to do is buy one of these other products which has the fake motor inside it, right? Now, here's where it gets, here's where the power struggle comes in. It's going to be virtually impossible for Mr. Dyson to go to the government of the country that's manufacturing that motor and say to the government, I want you to go and speak to the owners of the factory to stop making that motor because it's causing me a problem. Uh, it's really very difficult to do that. People have tried to do that in the past and it doesn't work because government does not get involved with those issues. They don't care. They're too busy. So what Mr. Dyson can do is he can threaten any consumer retail giant who purchases the product with that motor, that fake motor in them. He can threaten to sue them. And he can do that very easy in every single country that has a consumer uh, laws to protect the consumer. So in effect, the manufacturer of this cheap second uh, copy motor now has no uh, buyers who are going to purchase their products because they know when those products are delivered on a ship and they're sent to this other country, uh, Mr. Dyson and his company can sue the sales organizations of that country. And that's where, uh, when we talk about knowledge capital, knowledge controls, patents, patents infringement, uh, this is where uh, the reverse is, is now taking shape, where we don't talk to governments anymore because governments are lazy. Governments do not get involved with business affairs. Governments are interested in one thing, taxation. That's all they're interested in. How much tax can I get from this uh, organization, this institution, legally. They're not interested in patent colors or for them, that's a court's battle. So for patent infringement, this is how we deal with it now. And I, I actually know quite a lot about this, uh, being involved in global value chains, because uh, often the value chain directors have to conform to global regulations. One of them is the Treaty of Rome, which ensures uh, children are unemployed, are not employed in the, the production of this. We also look at the, uh, how women are employed to make sure that they are employed fairly, uh, they're paid well, the, where the product is manufactured, it follows all health and safety requirements, the anti-slavery uh, anti act, etc. Uh, so uh, being a global value chain specialist, we would identify the product straight away and usually we would say, where did you make the motor? 
Who made the motor? How come that motor looks very similar to Mr. Dyson's motor? Uh, we're not going to touch it. We're not going to export your product. And we switch off that country's supply chain uh, within 30 seconds. That's it. We inform all the supply chain directors in that country that this company is blacklisted for that product. And within one hour, that company's total investment has been a waste. And we do this using Petri, technology. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope that's answered the question for the team. Yeah. Yeah, please, uh, Deviana. Hello, Deviana. Oh, we have a question here about rubber. Yeah, uh, how about uh, rubber? Uh, rubber development. Okay, what I'm, I'm going to share with you my eight uh, questions. Let me go back to the slide. And uh, hopefully you can see the slide. These are some of my ideas. All right, okay. Uh, because of the size of Indonesia, uh, and we talk about rubber taking seven, let's say seven years to grow the tree, and then it lasts for 25 years. Uh, I think it's very important that Indonesia uh, identifies vast areas of land to grow more rubber trees. That this would be a fundamental investment uh, from government itself. Uh, also, the transfer of knowledge to local farmers, uh, the introduction of cooperatives, the sharing of knowledge uh, to explain how rubber yields can be increased to match, if not beat, uh, those of Thailand at 1.8 hectares per tonne. Uh, local manufacturing for rubber products for exports. Uh, this is where uh, the government and local business uh, goes to countries that buys wholesale raw rubber as an input, and then they manufacture it into the next stage. Uh, it's possible to go to these countries, not only in China, and say, why don't you transfer your business operations to Indonesia? Uh, we have tremendous tax rates. Uh, you can produce the, your finished rubber or semi-finished rubber products much cheaper, gaining a comparative advantage for you. And you could employ many people here in our country, as well as transferring the knowledge of rubber production from a, a raw material. Uh, government could open up investments uh, and they could deploy uh, different education programs in business universities to introduce academics or graduates to re-enter uh, the world of agrarian culture or the growing of trees, for example. Foreign direct investment and agricultural development, uh, training skills and development to combine this, again, is a, it's a government position, how the government would be able to introduce policy for foreign direct investment. The example I gave you earlier is how 11 years ago, uh, the Cambodian government changed their policy on foreign direct investment in rice milling. And the benefits 10 years later are substantial. Uh, the rubber industry focus for global exports. It's a case of new markets. Right now, uh, you'll see if you do more research, uh, Russia is a huge importer of rubber. And they do production themselves. That, that country is developing uh, substantially. So Northern Asia, Japan, Russia, uh, these, these large uh, developing countries, such as Russia, they are uh, they're looking for rubber imports. So these could be new markets for the industry to export to. Looking at new futuristic products to be made from rubber globally. Uh, right now, uh, many people understand plastic is a polluter. Uh, rubber, uh, if it is recycled using high temperatures, you can extract uh, the rubber compound from, the, for example, from the tire, and that can be reused again. And I do believe because of the size of Indonesia, its footprint, uh, I do believe that if Indonesia would to uh, actually grow 
uh, as many trees as it possibly could, I believe that Indonesia could have a comparative advantage on the global rubber market uh, where they would actually uh, set the price. Uh, they, they would develop huge revenues, uh, which could be then uh, distributed within the country uh, under the government's control in so many other areas. Uh, and that is purely because of the uh, size of the country. Uh, okay. So those are my thoughts on uh, rubber plantations, rubber exports, rubber development uh, from an international perspective and how the government itself can uh, maybe consider improving, changing, adjusting foreign direct investment in that particular area. Uh, bearing in mind there's a seven year wait and see before any rubber is actually uh, extracted. But it's quite clear uh, the farmers involved with rubber, they, they know what they're talking about. They, they, they produce rubber already. They just don't produce enough of it yield-wise per hectare. And this is not something which is only associated with Indonesia. I, I could say the same thing about uh, many countries in Asia who grow rice. Why does uh, Vietnam and Thailand grow a lot of rice? because they use a lot of fertilizer uh, on their rice, uh, which produces more rice. But the downside is it destroys the soil. So although uh, Thailand and in, uh, well, predominantly Thailand, their, their soil erosion and the pH balance of their soil is at 3.1, they virtually destroyed the soil over the past 25 years through over fertilization, which is a shame. Um, Thailand now is considering moving into a different economy, a knowledge-based economy, because uh, their soil uh, in the northern sections of Thailand is very, very dry. Uh, the nutrification of the soil is uh, at its lowest ever, and it would take the best part of 10 plus years to repair the soil. Uh, and the Thai government know this. Thai farmers are producing a heavy rice, not a fulfilling rice, and people are not buying it. Uh, so, you know, it's the sharing of knowledge and uh, finding that competitive advantage. Okay. Patrick, I'm sorry. Uh, we have so many questions to answer, but I can really... I, can, uh, I will choose uh, some of them. Uh, Rega asks... Okay. Yeah, yeah so many questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rega asks, uh, in global business, uh, we have... Uh, in uh, good change uh, uh, in others country, how a government should uh, treat about uh, SMS, local SMS, small medium enterprises. Sure. Are you talking about how the Indonesian government should? Yeah. Ah, well, the government itself should actively participate in uh, understanding how to export Indonesian products. There should be an active, uh, you know, there should be a, 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 a minister responsible for this who deals with other trade organizations to find out uh, what can we produce, how can we employ all our people, how can we support uh, SMEs in the growth idea of uh, new business ideas, uh, innovative ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So, Government should work hand in hand with business groups to identify what can be done. Secondly, number two, the government should uh, identify its sovereign wealth opportunity to where it can actually gravitate funding that it can be uh, deployed within the business uh, of SMEs. When you look at SMEs in the UK, for example, uh, over 75% of UK GDP is actually created uh, by SMEs, 75%. Uh, before COVID, it was closer to 90%. So the GDP of the UK, which is the fifth largest economy in the world, is the direct result of 90% SMEs, of which uh, the SMEs employed less than 15 people per SME. So that's a huge, uh, number, 15 people, right, per company. Uh, the number actually went down to even less than nine. So the government should also introduce 
a mechanism, a, a, a method of the introduction of entrepreneurialism, getting people to think, how can I do something different? How can I make something? Where is the market for my idea, my product? And as I'm sure your university, as many other universities, are uh, concentrating on developing the student's mindset. Uh, generation Z, which is the generation we're dealing with now, uh, they want to be entrepreneurs. They want to work for themselves. They don't see working for an organization as uh, a leadership role, but more of a coaching role. So the government should also understand, not just Indonesia, many governments are taking this position. Uh, how can we develop new products and services? How can we introduce finance or funding to develop the SMEs? And what trade barriers can we eliminate per country so that our product and services can be exported uh, through international business to these other countries? And that requires a trade contract, right? So ASEAN, uh, 14 nations, the uh, unique trade barrier. Europe has a trade barrier. Uh, it used to be 28 countries. Now it's 27 uh, because the UK has voted to leave the European Union. Uh, I voted leave also. I was tired of the, uh, the way the European Union was uh, controlling uh, so many other countries. And, and actually, uh, it was like a stranglehold around many countries in trying to do business. Uh, so the Indonesian government needs to understand its uh, local resources, uh, what it can grow, what it can make, what it can manufacture from its resources, how it can introduce a, a, a mechanism, a method of developing uh, students or people who want to move into their own businesses. What support can they give? Uh, what training programs can be provided by your institution? Uh, night classes, for example, where people are working during the day and maybe they can go online and they can understand uh, accounting. That's very important in, in a business, uh, money in, money out. So I think there's uh, lots of room for organizations uh, who are in the knowledge sphere uh, to develop short courses, uh, which can be uh, you know, deployed online through a method like Zoom, or they can be uh, sent uh, up to YouTube videos. It can be a series of YouTube videos. But it's the development of an entrepreneurial mindset which is very, very important. And often culture gets in the way of that entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, I'll finish on this, to, on this question. Uh, China has a very strong entrepreneurial mindset in the big cities. Once you leave the big city, that's it, communism 101. And you, you're only talking 15 minutes in a taxi and you can go from uh, state-of-the-art, idea, entrepreneurialism, change the world, 15 minutes in a taxi and it's communism 101. They only listen to government, right? So, so this is, and, and I've seen this, I've worked in China. Uh, and and uh, uh, Japan, uh, unfortunately, uh, does not... Uh, develop or warrant entrepreneurialism. They have a very hierarchical structure. And, and you must listen to the person above you because that person is your boss. Hello. So what entrepreneurialism is stifled, right? So it must be an open uh, society ideas for developing. Uh, and universities have a responsibility to do this, right? Uh, bringing people together, ideas, entrepreneurial clubs, uh, uh, new ideas, events. Uh, I think it's very, very important for today's generation. Hey, Patrick, and um, there are so many answers too about your question. Uh, how do we manage uh, rubber production? I can uh, read all of them, but I can uh, read uh, some of them. Uh, Nisrina said that um, rubber production in Indonesia have a low productivity compared with Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand. And her opinion, most rubber Indonesia need to increase the output for the future uh, and need technology and need to export more. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
that's for um, um, Ms. Rina uh, Atsar. Yes, and that's very good. Again, what, what's important in any nation is to look at what you've got and see how you can develop that into a need and want by other people, right? Uh, so you have to develop what you've got. So you have a huge area of land, right? So clearly you're able to grow things. Uh, you've got a larger area that, of land than you have a population. Yes, yes. I'm quite certain of that, right? So uh, you can uh, concentrate on the growing of products. Rubber is one, uh, food products are another, uh, but that's only the start of it. How do you maximize that? How do you introduce value add? Uh, once you start considering value add technologies, then you have to en engage in my world of global value chain. So first of all, you have to develop the internal supply chain structures, right? The internal supply chain structures. Uh, then you need to introduce both upstream development for inputs and downstream developments for outputs. And that introduces the mechanism of supply chain networks. And these are individual companies and people all connecting together into one main supply chain. And government must get involved with that sharing of knowledge, training, development, uh, working with banks to fund uh, people. Uh, an example would be uh, in Myanmar, if you own a rice farm, uh, every time you're uh, twice a year, you can go to the bank, Iowa Bank or KBZ Bank and say, okay, I own six uh, hectares of, of rice farm land. Uh, the government says I'm allowed to borrow $105 per hectare for 180 days at an interest rate of 6%. And providing you produce the land title, uh, the bank has to give you the money, right? Has to give you the money because that's a government requirement. And this is what funds the farmers uh, each time they're going to grow rice. So there must be an agreement, a joint venture between government and business in looking at their resources, how to develop their resources. Do we need to introduce funding, uh, foreign direct investment? If so, how much, what will we do, what will we allow, what will we not allow? Because there's always a, uh, and this is a very good, uh, credible question that government is also needs to protect the, the, the small guy, right? If you have huge foreign direct investment, multinational companies coming in, they wipe out the small guy. So all of a sudden you're producing a product that has been exported. Uh, the multinationals make money, but the small, the, the, you know, the small farmer, uh, he's wiped out. So there has to be a control of what FDI comes in, uh, how it's used, how it's deployed. Is it mechanism? Is it knowledge? Uh, but again, uh, there is the final piece of the puzzle, which is academia. Academia must be involved with this whole process. Uh, uh, you should be able to uh, engage with all those uh, people who want to get involved in business, what type of business, why, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then they must uh, interrelate between government uh, and the individuals themselves. It, 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 it's a large area, but it does require understanding your product and service that you want to export. This is the international business we're talking about now, not just local uh, consumption or manufacturing. This is yeah. pr primarily international business. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Patrick, time is up. Uh, I know uh, so many questions uh, and so many answer for your questions, but yeah, uh, time is up. So, That's great. Thank you so much. You... My dear students, I'm sorry I can't answer all your questions. I'm sure they're all wonderful questions. Thank you so much for engaging. Mr. Patrick, okay. could you please share your email? Because if there is some question from the participant, they could ask through the email from you. Could you please share your Yes. Email? So, uh, for the participants who have already have question, ya, yeah, untuk ada peserta yang ada pertanyaan bisa uh, bertanya lewat email Mr. Patrick yang sudah di share. Yeah, and before I sum up the this guest lecture, uh, we have some uh, we have a survey 
Pak Duyan, could you help me to share the survey? Please? Yes, the survey has already been uh, shared through the chat box. Please, for the participant, can uh, choose the link, yeah, click the link, and then fill in the survey on that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Mr. Patrick, for the fruitful insight. Uh, and from this uh, guest lecture, I am going to sum up this uh, guest lecture. Uh, international business is really important because there is no one country that there are benefits from uh, international business such as uh, increasing sales, acquiring uh, new and knowledge, reducing the risk associated and many more. There are many driver international business such as uh, export import, international investment of or FDI, international licensing, international franchising, and international management. Each of them has strengths and weaknesses. Uh, there are for uh, global business strategies such as export strategies, multi domestic strategy mega national standard strategy and transnational strategy especially for indonesia international business indonesia's international business indonesia has many commodities such as oil and gas uh, mineral crude uh, palm oil electrical appliance and the special commodity is rubber production and we have been discussion how to develop this sector through FDI for uh, agri development, global export, uh, strengthening the quality, identify the new product, and many more. And finally, we arrive at closing of this guest lecture agenda. I as the moderator, from the deep of my heart, I do and apologize for my mistakes while in hosting this event. Thank you very much for your attention the lecturer and our beloved student and the honorable our guest uh, lecture mr patrick please uh, applause for for mr patrick thank you all uh, so much yeah uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next event i wish you all a pleasant day have a good day stay safe and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh ya yeah, and don't forget to, yeah don't forget to uh, fill the survey and the present list 